Hello, my name is Franklin Tesler. I'm from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and I'm going to be talking about abdominal Doppler. This is a stamp honoring Christian Doppler, for whom the Doppler effect is named. I suppose a little bit of consolation for him only getting this stamp was the fact that he had a stamp with a small physics tutorial at the bottom that you could see those two diagrams showing the uh, Doppler effect diagrammatically. But when it comes to Doppler, to borrow the tagline from the folks at Overstock.com, it's really all about the O. Naturally, it's not the O I'm talking about, it's the angle. And that's illustrated in this image of a colored Doppler sonogram of a carotid artery. It may look that we're nicely below the magic angle of 60 degrees, here set at 42 degrees, but if you take a close look at the color Doppler image on top, you can see that the angle correction doesn't match the flow in the vessel as it should. It should really be set like this. Why is this so important? As we'll see as we go through the abdomen, some of the diagnoses you're going to be making within the abdominal vessels depend on accurate velocity measurements. To illustrate the importance of this, we go back to the Doppler equation, which you see at the top. If you rearrange the terms, you show how the machine is calculating the velocity within the vessel. C, the velocity of sound, is known. The Doppler shift is measured by the machine. F is the incident frequency. So the only variable left is that angle theta, the angle correction, or more correctly in this case, the cosine of that angle. The machine has no way of knowing what that is. You tell it what it is by setting the Doppler angle correction cursor. Let's look at an actual example here of a vessel with a true flow velocity of 100 centimeters per second and an angle of insulation of 60 degrees. All the other values are either constants or have been measured. In this case, the shift is 3,250 hertz. So if you're diligent and you set the angle correction properly, as I'm illustrating here, the measured velocity will be very close to the actual velocity of 100 centimeters per second. But what if you make a mistake and you're off by only 10 degrees, as is shown here? You've set a correction of 50 instead of 60. Remember, the machine doesn't know that it should be 60. You've told it. The calculated velocity in that case, as shown by the machine, will be 78 centimeters per second. That's a big difference. So angle correction is absolutely critical. If you don't do it properly, you will make errors in velocity measurements, and that can translate to errors in diagnosis. Note that that's not the same as a true 50 degree Doppler angle, as is shown here. If the angle is really 50 degrees, that's where you should set your cursor. The Doppler angle correction cursor should therefore be set parallel to the vessel, or more correctly, parallel to the flow stream in the vessel, which usually is parallel to the vessel wall. So with that introduct introductory technical point, let's do a quick tour through the abdomen. I'm going to cover the liver vasculature, followed by the renal vessels, a little bit on mesenteric arteries, and close with the IVC. Let's start off with the hepatic vasculature. The most prominent feature of the liver vasculature is the portal venous system, which we look at on pretty much every abdominal sonogram. The portal venous system accounts for about 70 to 75 percent of flow to the normal liver. Flow is usually monophasic, but it can be pulsatile in patients with right-sided cardiac dysfunction, right heart failure, tricuspid regurgitation, and in fact in some young individuals. And the normal velocity is extremely variable. This color Doppler sonogram shows a normal main portal vein with monophasic flow, in this case a velocity measured at the peak, although the use of the term peak here is a little bit different from the way it's used in arterial flow because it's not pulsatile, but in this case about 29 centimeters per second. As I said, the velocity varies widely. 
And, as I also just mentioned, it can be quite pulsatile, as in this case of a patient with right-sided cardiac dysfunction. Portal hypertension, which we are asked, often asked to look at in our patients, may be classified as intrahepatic, either pre or post sinusoidal, or extrahepatic, pre or post hepatic. It's defined as a portal vein to hepatic vein or IVC gradient of greater than or equal to 12 millimeters of mercury. The signs include dilation of the portal veins, SMV and splenic vein, and detection of collaterals with hepatofugal flow. And these collaterals are myriad, including the coronary vein, the short gastric veins, the umbilical vein, or spontaneous splenorenal shunts. And the most commonly seen or looked for sign, reversal of flow in the portal vein. Dilation of the portal vein is really not a very sensitive sign of portal hypertension, but when the portal vein is as large as we see here, almost 2.2 centimeters, that's a pretty good indication that flow within the portal venous system is abnormal. Here we have an example of reversal of flow in the main portal vein, as is shown by the blue color within the vein, showing flow away from the transducer and hence out of the liver. And here is the same patient shown on a spectral Doppler tracing with reversal of flow. At first glance, this sonogram looks pretty normal. We see the main hepatic vein with flow into the liver, and we see it here in the clip with a lot of hepatic arterial flow around it. And in fact, that could be a little bit of a clue because that's a common finding in cirrhotic patients. But if you follow flow through the liver and look diligently for the collaterals I mentioned, you'll find flow directed from the left hepatic vein along, in this case, a patent recanalized periembolical collateral vessel. And this vessel can be followed along the anterior abdominal wall, indicating that there is portal venous hypertension. Often we see varices near the splenic hilum. On grayscale, the spleen here is shown to be enlarged, but there are a number of sonolucent structures near the hilum, which on color Doppler imaging light up and these are varices in a patient with portal venous hypertension. Portal vein thrombosis is another diagnosis we get asked to look for quite frequently. But it's important to note that it may be very difficult or even impossible to distinguish very slow flow from actual thrombosis. Grayscale imaging is as important as Doppler interrogation because non-obstructive portal venous thrombus can be very difficult to see with color Doppler, where the color signal overwrites the thrombus. It's also important when you see thrombus in the portal venous system to look for flow in tumor thrombus in the setting of hepatocellular carcinoma. And I'll say more about that, how to detect that later. Here's a case of portal vein thrombus. In this case, there's no doubt that all these echoes within the portal vein are abnormal and indicate true thrombosis. And here's another case, in this case a clip, a lot of arterial flow, but no flow in the main portal vein, which is filled with low to medium level echoes indicating thrombus. In some cases with long-standing thrombus, you can get so-called recanalization of the portal vein, that is development of multiple collaterals. And in some cases those collaterals can, as in this case, simulate a patent portal vein on color or spectral Doppler imaging. And it's important not to fall into this trap and call this a patent portal vein. Usually the collaterals are smaller, more tortuous than the main portal vein, and it's important to follow the portal venous system from outside the liver, that is the splenoportal confluence, into the liver, and that usually makes it obvious. Portal vein thrombosis, as I just said, can also be related to hepatocellular carcinoma, as in this case. Especially in a cirrhotic, if you see portal vein thrombus, you need to look diligently at the hepatic parenchyma for the associated HCC. In some cases, the portal vein thrombus can be biopsied if there is no other suitable biopsy target, as I'm showing here. There are usually three major hepatic veins, right, middle, and left. 
but variations in accessory vessels are quite common. The waveforms are normally triphasic. This slide shows the right and middle hepatic veins coated in blue with flow toward the IVC where they converge. And this is a typical spectral Doppler tracing, in this case from the middle hepatic vein, showing the normal triphasic waveform. Monophasic waveforms, as in this case in the right hepatic vein, may be seen in a number of conditions, most notably cirrhosis, as in this case. The Bud Chiari syndrome is something we get asked to look for fairly commonly as well. It's really an amalgam of diagnoses, and it results from hepatic vein obstruction at any level, from the IVC to the main hepatic veins to the small venules. The grayscale findings include enlargement of the liver, hypertrophy of the caudate lobe, inability to visualize the hepatic veins, which usually, unless the liver is very abnormal otherwise, are easy to see, and thickening of the hepatic vein walls, or intraluminal clot or webs. In this case, the clot or webs would be the actual cause of the syndrome. On Doppler, we may see no or reversed flow in the hepatic veins or development of intrahepatic collaterals. Here's an example of a patient with Bud Chiari syndrome showing a small bit of color in the hepatic veins, but you can see the path of the right hepatic vein in this case on the grayscale image, and there is no flow on it. And here, of course, attention to technique is very important. And this is for an, an, older, an older article from 1993 from our group at UCLA, where we looked at color Doppler in uh, the Bud Chiari syndrome, in this case showing development of collateral vessels on the left, and the actual site of stenosis in the IVC, as indicated by the arrow on the right. The hepatic arteries are most important to look at in transplants because unlike in the non-transplanted patient the, where the portal venous system accounts for most of the flow, post-transplant the hepatic artery is extremely important. Anatomic variations such as a replaced main, right or left branch are common, although we typically don't diagnose those sonographically. Normally the arterial waveform is of a low resistance pattern as is shown here in this normal hepatic artery. Shunts are also frequently seen, spontaneous, operative, or transhepatic. In the past, operative shunts as therapy for portal venous hypertension were fa fairly common. We don't see those so frequently anymore, and the main types of shunts we look at these days are transhepatic shunts, and I will concentrate on those. But here is an example, a rare example in the case of my institution, of an operative porticaval shunt. And it's a little bit easier if I label the vessels for you, here in this case the portal vein and the IVC, and there is the shunt. You can actually see the flow communication through from one vessel to the other in grayscale and then in color. But those shunts you have to look for really carefully. The communication site is often not very large and deep, so it can be somewhat difficult to see. The most frequent type of shunt we see these days are TIPS, transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunts. The most important take-home point in these is that angle correction, going back to what I said earlier, is critical. And I always do the angle correction using the grayscale, not the color Doppler image. You want the angle correction cursor to be parallel to the flow stream, and that's often easier to tell on the grayscale images they'll show you. It's also important to know that the shunt may not be seen in the first few days because of gas around the shunt, and that can shadow and completely obscure the shunt, so we tend not to do baseline sonograms early. It's important to measure the velocity at at least three points in the shunt, the so-called portal vein terminus, mid-shunt, and the hepatic vein terminus. Thrombosis is indicated by lack of flow on Doppler imaging, whether color or spectral. Stenosis is more difficult to diagnose, and a variety of criteria have been published for this, including velocities less than 90 per centimeters per second, or what I think is more important, a decrease 
from baseline. Here's an example of normal flow at the portal vein terminus of a shunt, and it illustrates the importance of angle correction using the grayscale image. I like to zoom up the image quite a bit so I can see the vessel wall of the shunt rather very clearly and set the angle correction cursor that way. In this case, the velocity is 57 centimeters per second, but this was a normal shunt. It had not changed from baseline. That's why I think that a change from baseline can be a more important indicator of impending stenosis than just an absolute velocity. And here we see the flow velocity measured at the other end of the shunt. In this case, the operator has elected to do it with the color Doppler image. But you can see that the color Doppler makes it a little harder to tell where the walls of the shunt are, although in this case, we're probably not too far off. This is a case of a thrombo shunt shown in this clip, and you can see there's no flow here. Remember that early on, you may not see anything because of gas shadowing, but that's not true in this case. We can see the shunt, we just don't show the flow. And this is a thrombosed shunt. Here is another shunt with a stenosis with a velocity of almost 48 centimeters per second at the portal vein terminus. And this did represent a significant drop from the previous scan. And looking further distally in the shunt, in this case in the mid, the velocity increased to 2.4 meters per second, indicating a shunt stenosis. Here's another common site for shunt stenosis. This is where the shunt enters into the hepatic vein. You can see that as color Doppler aliasing. And here's the corresponding spectral Doppler tracing showing a high velocity of 2.7 meters per second. Post-transplant, the role of ultrasound is to detect vascular complications early so they can be corrected and not require explantation. As I mentioned, the hepatic artery is very important post-transplant. It assumes a predominant role in blood supply to the liver. Normally, it has a low resistance weight form with a resistive index of 0.55 to 0.80. But it's important to remember that high resistance flow is common in the early post-operative period. It is not abnormal. Complications include stenosis, thrombosis, and much less common pseudoaneurysms. Here's an example of uh, an arterial tracing, post-transplant, normal. And here's one post-transplant, early in the post-operative period, with essentially no diastolic flow. This is normal. Thrombosis is indicated by lack of flow in the proper hepatic artery or intrahepatic branches, whereas stenosis which usually occurs at the anastomotic site, is associated with a focal elevation of velocity with turbulence, just like stenosis elsewhere. The problem is that the site of anastomosis is often difficult to see in these patients, particularly if they're in the ICU setting. So we rely on indirect signs quite a bit, such as a tardis parvus waveform in intrahepatic branches and a resistive index of less than 0.5, indi as indicated in this case the main hepatic artery. This is almost a monophasic waveform with a resistive index of 0.32 in this patient with hepatic artery stenosis. It's also important to look at the portal and hepatic veins post-transplant, in the portal vein looking for thrombus, stenosis, or aneurysm, and the hepatic veins in IVC to look for stenosis or thrombosis. But these complications are less common. Now let's shift to the renal vessels, starting off with the renal arteries. And the main reason we get asked to look at the renal arteries is for stenosis in patients with refractory hypertension. The diagnosis can be based on either direct or indirect criteria. For the indirect criteria, you interrogate the segmental arteries and look for absent early systolic peaks and tardis parvus waveforms. The direct criteria require accurate angle-corrected velocity measurements in the main renal artery of at least 200 centimeters per second. There are a wide variety of criteria here as well. Or, as we use in our lab, a renal artery to aortic peak systolic velocity ratio of 3.5 to 1 or greater. 
It's important, however, to look distally, especially in younger patients who may have fibromuscular dysplasia, which, ten which tends to involve the distal vessel. Whereas in the older population with atherosclerotic narrowing, the stenosis us is usually very close to the ostium. To get the ratio that I talked about, of course, you have to measure the velocity in the proximal aorta, as is shown here, in this case, at uh, a peak systolic velocity of 0.8 meters per second, and that's the basis for the ratio measurement later on. This is one of the first things we do in the renal artery Doppler sonogram. But then, of course, we go on to look at the vessels indirectly and directly, in this case within the kidney, looking at the intraarterial waveforms. These are normal with sharp upstrokes. We also pay some attention to the resistive index, although an increase in the resistive index tends to be nonspecific. And, of course, we look at the main renal arteries. Doing that can be technically very challenging, especially in large patients. It's facilitated by having the patients fast overnight to reduce bowel gas, but it can be, still be very difficult to do. In this case, we have an abnormal intrarenal waveform, in this case the uh, middle of the kidney showing a tardis parvus waveform in this patient with renal artery stenosis further proximally, and in the same patient interrogating the main renal artery showing very high velocity flow with aliasing due to stenosis. We sometimes get asked to look at the renal veins for thrombosis as well although we have an adult popu patient population at our institution, and this is a more common diagnosis in children than adults, and can be associated with various conditions, including dehydration, nephrotic syndrome, hypercoagulable states, those are some of the predisposing factors, and more commonly we see renal vein thrombosis related to renal tumors, primarily renal cell carcinoma, with associated with tumor thrombus. Here's one such case a clip showing this kidney with a large mass in the anterior part of the kidney, and in this other clip showing the right renal vein, which is distended with tumor thrombus. More on that in a little bit. There's also an incidental gallstone. Next, I want to talk to you a little bit very quickly about the mesenteric vessels. There are a variety of indications for looking at the mesenteric vessels, the arteries primarily with ultrasound, including Bruis, suspected aneurysms, and most commonly suspected mesenteric insufficiency. This, like the renal sonogram, is best done with the patient fasting and early in the day. It's important to examine all the vessels as best you can, the celiac axis and its branches, the SMA and the IMA. And I won't go into this in great detail, just to mention that various thresholds have been published. These are the ones that I use in the celiac axis and the IMA 200 centimeters per second and the SMA 275 centimeters per second. Here's an example of an abnormal case of celiac axis with a peak systolic velocity of greater than 4 meters per second, in this case with celiac axis stenosis. I want to close by talking about the IVC. The hepatic segment of the IVC is easiest to see, and in fact, looking at the IVC is part of every normal abdominal sonogram, even if Doppler isn't being performed. You have to look at the IVC structurally. The waveforms within are, are variable, but usually similar to the hepatic veins to monophasic. And as I mentioned, you can get tumor thrombus in patients with renal cell carcinoma, or you can get bland thrombus in other conditions. And this, in fact, is the same patient that I showed you earlier with the IVC and right renal vein thrombus related to a large renal cell carcinoma. In this case, the IVC is distended with echogenic thrombus. And one trick that I found useful in showing that this is tumor thrombus and not bland thrombus is not to use color or power Doppler because I think that can be very difficult and you can see a lot of artifact and spurious signals. And you really want to know that you're looking at a pulsatile signal. So what I do is I put the spectral Doppler cursor with a very large sample volume uh, or sample gate on the thrombus as I've done here. In this case, I've shown a low resistance arterial pattern related to neovascularity 
in this tumor thrombus. We can occasionally see thrombus in the IVC from other causes, whether it is propagation from below in patients with lower extremity DVT, or as in this case, thrombus in the IVC related to a filter as is shown in this color Doppler image. So to summarize, I'd like to reiterate two points. One is to pay close attention to angle correction. As I've said before, if you are incorrect in your correction, as it were, you will get incorrect velocity measurements, and that can lead to incorrect diagnoses. And second, to use grayscale and Doppler color and spectral imaging in concert in making your diagnoses. Thank you very much.